All right. Good morning. Welcome to the morning service of Berean Baptist Church. We are glad that you have joined us this morning. Uh, by the way, of uh, live stream internet. And if you just heard our Bible class, you ought to be all excited. Amen. I know it excited me and stirred me. Folks, we better, Brother Aaron said it so well, we had better begin to get stirred up. But you're seeing things come to uh, fruition to this morning. You're th seeing things happening in the world today that is absolutely and totally predicted in the book of Revelation. We're living, I believe, in the day uh, approaching the rapture of the church, the trumpet of God, and we're, we're seeing coming up to that day, we're seeing things. Who, I, Listen, folks, we're being set up. The world is being set up. I'm not being set up. I'm going to be caught up, amen. But we're the world is being set up with all that's going on. Uh, we're being the world is being set up for the Antichrist to set up his rule, amen. What a great lesson, brother Aaron brought this morning, and it should excite you, should uh, cause you to want to serve God in these latter days. I believe we're living in the latter days, amen. Uh, there. <clears throat> but before we look into God's word this morning, uh, I have a few announcements I, I need to make uh, and share with you. Uh, first of all, of course, is to, for you to be much in prayer for the Weaver family. They are flying up to Ohio today. Uh, they will have services for Brother Milo on Tuesday at a cemetery, private, uh, private services, but they, they'll have some there. Uh, around 11 o'clock Tuesday. So you might want to remember them in prayer. Remember Cindy. I talked to Chrissy last night and she's taking it real hard naturally and, and bless her little heart. So be much in prayer for that. Tonight, Brother Jan will be uh, bringing the evening message. Uh, it's his turn to do that. and We're always privileged to have him uh, do that. Then I'm excited this morning. I, I have been under... Uh, burden, prayer, seeking God's will. Uh, I, I have counseled with several folk trying to get the temperature of the church on what we ought to do about resuming services. And I have come to the conclusion this morning, I believe I'm in the will of God. I pray that I am. I seek, I feel in my heart that I am, that we will begin and resume our services next Sunday morning here at the church at 9.30, the Bible class, and of course, 10.30, the morning worship, and we will open the doors of the church if you would like to come. We're not going to put pressure on anyone. If you do not feel comfortable in coming, that's okay. You and God make your decision but it's, this could go on forever and we just keep putting it and putting it and putting it off yeah. uh and, and it wouldn't make no difference how long you put it off uh they, they i understand there would be some that would even then would probably not be comfortable but please do not feel like that there's any pressure or anybody's going to judge you or look down upon you if you do not feel like you ought to come next sunday morning It'll, I thought Mother's Day would be a great day to open up the church again. So be praying for those services, if you will. Now, here is what we're going to do. We're going to uh, resume the service uh, <clears throat> I like I said, I've talked to several, and I've heard many say, preacher, we, we, we want to be back in church. We want to be back in God's house. I left Betty this morning, and I and she knows she's watch. Uh, she'll watch this if she's not watching. I left her crying this morning, saying, "I want to be in church. I want to be in God's house." And I trust that there are many of you this morning that feel that exactly the same way. 
that you want to be in God's house. I, I've said throughout this, I appreciate the internet. I appreciate the live stream, but it is not, and it never will be a substitute for assembling ourselves together in the house of God. And I do not want people to get to become habit formed that, well, you know, I got up a little late this morning and, and uh, uh, I don't really feel too, too good. I'll just watch it on the internet. That is not, I do not believe anything like that. Now, if someone's sick, they can't come, that under, that's understandable. But just to lay out a church because you're all go, we're going to be on the internet, that is not in the will of God. Amen. So anyway, uh, I, uh, my wife was crying this morning, wanting to be in God's house. Now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to follow the guidelines of our governor. We're going to have the spaces. I'm not sure it'll be com a complete six feet, but we will space the seating. Uh, what we feel like is comfortable. Whatever what people feel like setting is comfortable uh, on it there. We will not have any hugging or handshaking at the moment. Uh, that's that's hard for me. Uh, there, we're, we're, Our church is not built to be just an old, formal, dead, cold church where folks come in and sit down and, and then get up and leave. Uh, we have a loving congregation, but we will follow the guideline for the time being uh, uh, therein. Uh, you can wear a mask if you want to. That will be your choice. That's what they're doing at the stores. You can wear it if you want to or you can uh, on it there. So you can wear a mask if you wish to do so. Again, no one will be pressured to come. We're going to get the word out this week and the door will be open. And if you want to come and worship in the God's house, you will be most welcome. Amen. Amen. So we'll look forward to seeing you in person. The Lord willing, uh, next Sunday morning on Mother's Day uh, there. And so we'll be celebrating that beautiful day that honors the mothers uh, of this land. So we hope and pray that you'll pray about it and you will act as God will lead you to act. All right. With that in mind, take your Bibles. This, oops, excuse me. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've got something I want to do this morning. Kind of change the format just a little bit. Uh, we've, we have asked Brother David uh, Morris to come. He's our engineer, really, for the Internet. But he is also has a beautiful voice. And David's going to come and begin our service this morning by singing for us. Uh, there. What a joy it is to start this service like this. You come, Brother David. Amen. Good morning, church family. My name is David Morris. I'm the IT engineer here for the church. As my church family knows, I also do some of the special music here. I'm one of many. I'm nothing special or anything. But um, I always like to, I usually like to try to pick a song based off of a theme. I picked Amazing Grace this morning because we are very blessed today Amen. to be able to despite all of the things that are going on in the world right now, that we're able to at least have an online service. We're blessed that hopefully we'll be able to have, well, we plan on having uh, regular services again soon. And we're blessed that as far as I know, we've all maintained health Amen. in this church. Amen. Um, I have a friend that we prayed for. Um, <coughs> my uh, Somebody very special to me is a sister. Her name is... Taylor. She's a uh, Brooke's sister. And we prayed for her and she's doing well now. She's uh, back to normal. Praise God. Prayer works. Anybody that says otherwise, well, they need to read their Bible. They need to open their eyes and look around. Anyway, pray for our president. Pray for Brooke. Pray for the church. Anyway, I'm going to do the first and the last verses. 
Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. When we've been there ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun, We've no less days to sing God's praise than when we had first begun. God bless. Amen. 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 Thank you, Brother Dave. I appreciate that. Praise God. Thank God for amazing grace. Amen. Take your Bibles this morning. This sort of fits in a little bit with the message. Turn to 1 Corinthians, if you will, chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Back in 1929, a man by the name of E.C. Seagar, he created a comic strip, a character, which became one of the most famous animated cartoons on the movie screen. This character was a rough, tough looking individual. He had a squint eye. Uh, uh, he had huge forearms and an anchor tattooed on each one of those arms and he smoked a corn cob pipe. Some of you this morning may remember him and know who I'm talking about. He was called Popeye the Sailor Man. Now, I'm not going to preach on Popeye, but I want to say a few things about him before I get in, look into God's Word. You find that if you know anything about him, Popeye was known for two things. He was always in a struggle between him and his rival named Bluto over his girlfriend, Olive Oil. And when Bluto was winning the struggle, Popeye would somehow pull out a can of spinach somewhere out of nowhere, and he would swallow it down, and immediately he would become strong, uh, uh, super strong. And he would rescue olive oil from the clutches of Bluto. However, besides being famous because of the spinach that made him super strong, Popeye became famous for a saying that he used in almost every episode uh, that he was in. And that saying was simply this, I am what I am. I am, I'll put it in English, I am what I am. Some, uh, you know, we often hear that saying today. I, I, you talk to people. And in the conversation, whatever, the, however the conversation may lead, I've heard people say, I am what I am. That's who I am. And what that simply means is this. You are what you profess to be. In other words, you in, say, in saying that, I am what I am. You're saying to whoever you're talking to, I don't pretend to be something that I'm not. When you see me, you see who I am and what I am. In other words, you're the same today as you were yesterday, and you will be the same tomorrow as you are today. Now, this was the testimony. You say, where are you going, preacher? All right. This was the testimony of the Apostle Paul recorded in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where he was defending himself against those who were questioning his apostleship. Let me read it for you. Uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 
beginning with verse 10 and verse 11. This is Paul writing to the church at Corinth, and he says, By the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. Woo! Amazing grace. Thank you, Brother David. Uh, there. But I, Paul says, I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believe. Uh, there it is. I want you to notice what Paul is saying here, especially in verse 10, where he says, By the grace of God, I am what I am. And nothing is going to change that. And by the grace of God, he's saying here, I'm going to keep on preaching and serving the Lord. And he's saying, I'm not going to change. Amen. I am what I am. So that's the title of the message this morning. I am what I am. Am. And I want to share with you from God's word, and I hope what I say pertaining to using the, uh, the reference to me as a preacher, I hope the message will also permeate into you that you will pick up on some things that you'll be able to say to a lost and dying world, hallelujah, I am what I am. And it's not going to change. I'm going to be the same today as I was yesterday, and I'm going to be the same tomorrow as I am today on it uh, there. You see what Paul was saying here in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, he's saying, by the grace of God, I am what I am. That's, that's who I am. And I don't need to chase this rabbit, but God called him and, and set him apart as one, uh, what uh, he says as an apostle out of due time. And there were those questioning his ministry. And they were questioning his apostleship. And they were trying to discredit him as an apostle and as a preacher of the gospel. And Paul, uh, Paul just came back and said to them, listen, I am what I am, and that's the way it's going to be, amen. I am what I am. And so I want to share with you quickly this morning, I believe it'll be a blessing to you, uh, four things that identify me as a preacher of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and just say these four things identify me, I am what I am. I will be the same today as I was yesterday. And I will be the same tomorrow as I was today. In other words, I do not want to and will not pretend to be something that I'm not. Well, I, I am what I am. So let me share with you quickly this morning some things that I can stand before you and say, I am what I am. What are they? Number one, first of all, I am a strong Baptist. Amen. Now let me clarify this by saying this. I'm not ashamed, nor do I apologize for being an old-time Bible-believing Baptist preacher. Have no apology about that whatsoever. On it. And I want to emphasize the word Baptist. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I do not uh, 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 and, and am not saying and do not believe that Baptists are the only ones who are saved and going to heaven. I didn't say that. What I'm saying is simply this. I'm proud to be identified as a Baptist and what Baptists believe. That's why I'm a Baptist. It's because of what we believe and stand for. 
You see, in the day when so many so-called Baptists are taking the name Baptist off of their church marquee and are putting up something like uh, the fellowship, the bridge, uh, uh, whatever you want to call it uh, therein, uh, I tell you something about that. I do. I'm. I. It, it gets to me. Amen. I just kind of get down a, just a homey way of preaching, I guess, this morning. But listen to me uh, on it. Uh, in a time when they're doing this, when the when the name Baptist is coming off of church after church after church, I just want to make uh, say this. I plan to remain a Baptist and what Baptists have stood for down through the years. I don't plan to change. I am what I am. Every true Baptist should do one thing. They should read the little booklet, The Trail of Blood. If you're not a strong Baptist and you're sincere to wanting to know why we believe what we do, then it would do you well to get this little booklet, The Trail of Blood, and read it because if you're not a strong Baptist, this book will convince you that you ought to be. Amen. Uh, on it there. Now, I'm a Baptist for three basic reasons. There's a lot more, but I've got three basic reasons why I'm a strong Baptist. First of all, I'm a Baptist for what we stand upon. And by that I mean our doctrines which are founded upon the word of God, which is the old King James book. Amen. Ah, uh, there. I believe this. If you cannot back it up with the Bible, you need to examine what you believe. I am a Baptist because what of what Baptists stand for. Or stand upon. Secondly, I'm a Baptist for what we stand against. <laughs> you see, we don't all, all, we don't not only just stand on something, but you hear me this morning. We stand against some things. What what do you stand against, preacher? Well, number one, just to sum it up, I stand against sin. Amen. I really do uh, on it uh, there. I stand against the wickedness. That's in this nation today. All of the uh, perversion and immorality and sin and ungodliness and, un and, and all of this is going on. Uh, listen, as a Baptist, I stand and can voice my voice again. I stand again. It. Amen. That's why I'm a Baptist. What, I, what we stand for, what we stand against, and, and then the, uh, or what we stand upon. What we stand against, and I'm a Baptist for what we stand for. What do you stand for? I stand for what is right and godly and righteous, and what the book tells us we ought to be for. Amen. That's why I'm a Baptist. There are some other things, but confines of time. I've been going away too long on these messages as it is. But nevertheless, uh, I am what I am. And the first thing I am is I'm a strong Baptist. I make no apology for it. And I have no intention of changing. Amen. But secondly, I am what I am. I'm not only a strong Baptist but I am a spiritual separatist. I hope you got that. I am a spiritual separatist. What do you mean by that preacher? I mean, I believe that God meant what he said when he inspired Paul to write in second Corinthians chapter six, these words. I want to share them with you. If you, if you're not familiar with it, Here's what the Bible says about this business of separation. You, you know, many of you know it, but it doesn't hurt for you to listen to it again. It says in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light 
with darkness. And what concord hath Christ with Baal? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God which with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Listen, uh, the Holy Spirit within me tells me that I am to be separate from certain things and certain people. Amen. Uh, all of there. Here's the verse. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and then I will receive you. As a Baptist, I am what I am, in that I believe in spiritual separation. Uh, now, these scriptures are not referring to isolation. A lot of times preachers get misquoted. And somebody goes out and says, well, the preacher said this when he didn't say that at all. I'm not talking about isolation or, or withdrawing ourselves from society. That's not what I'm talking about. Uh, not say you know I'm not saying no, have no uh, inner uh, uh, counter with the with uh, society and all that you know in fact Jesus himself said we are in the world but we're not to be a part of the world that's the words of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, on it so <clears throat> we are you know I've had people say oh you old uh, a hard-headed, narrow-minded Baptist, and and you believe this and that. Yes, we do. Yes. And one of the things we believe is a spiritual separation from the world. Amen. You see, the Bible says there's three things we need to be separate from. I'll give them to you. The first one is do we, we are to be separate from worldly allurements. Church, let me say something to you this morning. Not all the world. There's some things in the world that's just absolutely, uh, uh, you know, it's fun to be with, do and fun to be with and, 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 and enjoyable to be around. But hear me this morning. There are some things in this world that a Christian has no business of, uh, associating with. Amen. Just, you say, well, it's not so bad. It may not be so bad, but did you know as a born-again Christian, everywhere you go, every person you meet, you are a testimony to them. And if you are uh, 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 doing something in the world that is a bad testimony to the Lord Jesus Christ, you ought not to be doing it. Amen. We need to be separated from the world. In fact, in, uh, in uh, 1 John 2.15, the Bible says, Love not the world, and neither the things that are in the world. There are just some things in this world. There are some things in this world I could do. And really, as far as harm, it might not be any harm. There are some places in this world I could go. And for me, it might not, it, it might be okay. But whatever it is, I'll just put it this way. Whatever it is that would belittle my testimony, I better stay away from it. You heard, you heard a little bit this morning about watching some of this stuff on TV uh, on it uh, there. Listen, there are just some things on TV that a Christian ought not to watch. They're just, hey, I'll go a step farther. I like the Internet. I like this uh, streaming. But there's a lot of things on this Internet a Christian has no business watching. And I'll be honest with you, I, I, I'm thankful we got Facebook and YouTube and all that. 
But you hear me this morning, there's a lot of things on Facebook that ought not to be there. And there's a lot of things on YouTube that ought not to be there. I heard something this morning, I probably misconstrued it, but about uh, Brother David was mentioning something about uh, something on Facebook that he ought not to look at. So there's a lot of things on Facebook you ought not to look at on it there. Uh, and I'll tell you another thing. Facebook is, is not a place for God's people to be gossiping with each other. Be careful what you post and what it's about. Can I, I, I wish I could get an amen, but these empty pews don't give me much. <laughs> but we ought to be uh, uh, separate from worldly allurements. Secondly, the Bible teaches, we ought to be separate from wicked attractions. There again, I guess I've sort of mentioned it, but <laughs> there are just there are just some things in the world that uh, the, this, the Bible teaches. This world is like a magnet; it 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 it's, it's got things that attract the flesh. It, it draws us to it like a fly to a light. On it there, I'm, I recall in the Bible there was one. Mentioned in Second Peter by the name of Lot. You know what it says about him? He was vexed, or his righteousness was vexed, because he mixed with the ungodly. <laughs> he, he, what, what attracted, what attracted Lot to Sodom? What was it? You know what it was? He stood that day on the plains of Sodom. You can check it out with his uncle Abraham. And the Bible says he looked over the plains of Sodom and he saw the beautiful grass, the beautiful plains, his, his sheep, his cattle could uh, eat, enjoy. He saw the beauty of Sodom. But when he got into Sodom, he started mixing with the evil of Sodom. You find, and I believe this, I can't prove it. I've had other preachers say it so, and I, I, I agree, I kind of go along with it. When those angels came to warn Lot to get out of Sodom, the Bible says he was sitting at the seat of the rulers. I kind of believe he had worked himself into being mayor of Sodom. I can't prove that. But why do I know one thing? He had got to Sodom because it attracted him. And he and in that attraction, hear me, he didn't listen to what God would have him to do. We need to separate ourselves from those things. I hope you can get it. We need to separate ourselves from anything. I would rather say it that way. Anything that would draw us from the Lord Jesus Christ. And then thirdly, we are to separate ourselves from wrong associations. You see, when, uh, I guess I just said it, but when Lot got down into Sodom, he began to associate with the Sodomites. Yeah. He, hey, he should have went down there and began to preach against the sin of sodomy. He should have been down there and had a testimony that they knew that there was something different about him and, that, and, and, and his God but he was down there associating with that crowd. And you know what it cost him? It cost him his home, cost him his wife, and eventually it cost him his children. Why? All because 
he had not separated himself and he had become a part of, of uh, Sodom. Folks, let me say this. As a Christian, you better be what crowd you run around with. I've said this from this pulpit. It bothers me that many Christians seem to have more fellowship with the world than they do with God's people. How do you know that, preacher? Because they'd rather be in the world with uh, whatever they're doing when God's uh, church is in session. Uh, they're, they're out in the world doing something when they ought to be in the house of God. You hear me this morning. The Bible warns us that who we associate with influences us. Oh, I've heard people, I've heard young people, especially young ladies, getting married to some character that's unsaved and worldly. And they, I've heard, they've said it to me. Yeah, yeah preacher, I, I, I'm, I love him and I'm going to change him. Nine out of ten. The change came all right, but it was him changing her. Oh, listen, you're not strong enough on your own. Now, with God, you could be, but you're not strong enough to associate with the worldly crowd and still maintain a spiritual life. God has always wanted his people to be a separate people. I, amen. So I am what I am when it comes to separation. I believe the Bible teaches it. I believe we ought to uh, uh, practice it and we ought to do it uh, on it there. You see, in this day of ecumenical unity and non-denominationalism and the emphasis is on the liberal theology and doctrinal compromise, Baptists have always been separated from that bunch. Amen. I'm talking about true Baptists. Have always been separated from that bunch. And I am going to continue to be separated from it. I am what I am. And that's all I am. And then quickly this morning, number four, I am a scriptural literalist. Literalist. You say, what do you mean by that? I mean by this, I believe the Bible literally. I believe it as a preserved word of God in the King James translation. I, with all my heart and soul, I believe the King James Bible is the inspired word of God as recorded in 2 Timothy 3.16, where it says all scripture is given by inspiration. It didn't say some scripture. It didn't say part of a scripture. It said all scripture is given by inspiration of God. I believe this book is the entire book is the inspired infallible word of the living God. Uh, on it there. I do not believe that you can pick out what, this and that and say, well, I believe that's true, but I don't believe this is true. Uh, listen, all of the word of God in the King James Bible is inspired by God. Amen. Uh, on it there. As such, I believe the word of God, three things or four about it. I believe it's perfect. You find that in Psalms 19.7. <clears throat> you can read it. And that just simply means there's absolutely no error or mistake in this book. You can't find one. No matter what the liberals claim and this type of thing uh, on it there. And then uh, this word of God, not only perfect, this word of God's permanent. 
Uh, you'll find that in Psalms 119.89. Uh, there's no change. No change. It's, uh, we'll get to that in a moment. This word of God in Hebrews is powerful. For the word of God is more powerful than a two-edged sword. Tearing asunder the souls of men. And then Paul writes in 2 Timothy again, this word of God is profitable. It's profitable for doctrine, what we believe. It's, pro it's pro uh, profitable, it says, for correction, to keep us straight in what we believe. It's, it's uh, profitable for uh, conviction. It'll, you read it. You know why most people stay away from the word of God? It convicts them of their sin. And then it's profitable for conversion. It tells you how to get saved. Amen. Oh, it's there. All of these, listen to me. I'm not ashamed to say it. I am what I am. All, all of these new per, uh, Bibles, these new perversions are nothing but perversions. Amen. A lot of folk don't like that, but a lot of good Baptist people do uh, are there. What I'm saying is this. We don't need a new Bible. We just need to believe and obey the Bible we got. Amen. Amen. There it is. That's old-fashioned, I know. <laughs> but I am what I am. I, I, I believe in scriptural literacy that we're that it's literal you see the bible will do four things for you first of all i mentioned it but it will convict you of sin and so you just push uh, you know I, if you don't read it you don't have to worry about conviction much but it'll do that it not only that but the, the book will convert you of that sin then the bible will console the sorrowful and the Bible will comfort the saint. There's no other book on the face of the earth that can do what God's word can do. I'm glad that I stand on the word of God. Amen. I am what I am, but let me close with this. I am a solid fundamentalist. I hope you get this. You see, theology or, or a Christian doctrine is found uh, among four, four theological positions. Every denomination, every church believes or adheres to one of these four positions. There is what we call the liberal or the moderate position. These are those that disbelieve or deny or even or doubt the word of the living God. They, are, they, are, they find fault with the Bible and the truths of the Bible. And they will tell you, well, you can't depend on uh, certain verses of the Bible. There's the liberal and the modern pos position. And a lot of our churches adhere to that position today. I'm, I, hate, I hate to say that. But then there is the evangelical or the middle of the road position. You hear a lot today about being evangelical. I, I hear Baptists say they're evangelical. Well, praise God this morning. I'm more than evangelical. I'm fundamental. Amen. Uh, you see the evangelical. Uh, they're 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 more prone to the ecumenical type of uh, belief and ecumenical movement. Uh, there, the, the evangelical will just absorb anything that comes down the pike. Doesn't make any difference. You know, all uh, I hear, all baptisms are the same. Uh, this philosophy of the evangelical. Well, we're all going we're all going the same place, but we're just taking different roads to get there. Well, you take whatever road you may choose, but I'll cho choose the road of the cross. Amen. 
But there's evangelicals. There's, and a lot of folk identify as being evangelical. And Baptists, I hear Baptists say, identify as evangelical. Well, I'm more than that. But then there's the conservative. <laughs> What's a conservative? Well, that's those between the, <laughs> they stand between the evangelical and the fundamental. The conservative wants to have it both ways. They don't want to be strict or they don't want to be too liberal. They just, they just sort of want to straddle the fence or walk the middle of the road. By the way, the middle of the road's a dangerous place to be. You'll get run over. But there's this, there's people who say, I'm a conservative. What's that mean? It means anything you want it to mean, really. <laughs> Whatever you want it to mean. But praise God, there's the fourth group this morning, and that is the fundamentalist. Now, who are they? They are those who believe, as I've already preached the Bible, literally, they hold a certain doctrines that are fundamental to the faith. I'm going to take the time, and uh, I'm seeing it's getting down there, but listen, a fundamentalist, if he's a true fundamentalist, fundamental Baptist, he will not compromise when it comes to certain doctrines. I, I'll give you a list of some. The verbal, plenary inspiration of the Word of God. We will not compromise on that. Amen. Just not going to. The virgin birth of Jesus. We're not going to compromise one iota that our Savior was virgin born. Amen. His virtuous, sinless life. They, we're not going to compromise on one moment that there was one pinpoint of sin in him. He was absolutely perfect and pure and sinless. The vicarious death and shedding blood on, on Calvary. We will never compromise. That without the shedding of blood, there is no redemption. Amen. And then, of course, his victorious bodily resurrection. Hey, he came out of that grave bodily. He rose from the dead. Amen. And then we will not compromise. Brother Aaron is really hitting this. We will not compromise on the visible pre-tribulation return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'm getting a lot of Baptists getting sucked into this pre or, or this mid-trib junk. There. Let me tell you something. If you want to go through the tribulation and help yourself, I want to go up with a trumpet myself. Amen. Yeah. On it there. I mean, what he's been preaching, I don't want to go through that. And by the way, can I tell you this morning? I'm not going to. I'm going up when the trumpet sounds. Amen. Amen. And then along with these doctrines, let me show you a few more that are baptistic. Now, there's some who believe some of these things. They do, but they believe it along with a lot of other stuff. And these are some doctrines you can't mix. I hope you understand what I'm getting at. These are some doctrines that you must hold to and not try to tie into anything else. Number one is the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and the God the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says, though they are three, they are one. Amen. Any doctrine that denies the Trinity is a false doctrine and will lead you to hell. Then there's the doctrine of the incarnation. Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. He said he was. There's those who deny it. 
Uh, I've heard them. I've heard some say, "Well, he was uh, while he was down here. He was he was he was just a man. Yes, he was a man, but he was the man God or the God man." And then there's the doctrine of the belief in a literal heaven and hell. I'm telling you something. From most poets, you don't hear uh, you hear very little about heaven, and almost in this day and age, you hear nothing about hell. I, there's a many denominations this morning that do not believe that hell is a real place with real fire and real torment. But I want to tell you on the authority of God's word, Jesus says it is. Amen. Then there's the doctrine of salvation by grace alone. Amen. Without works, without any effort, without, without water, without rituals. Uh, and, and all of that burning candles without all this garbage we believe that for by grace are you saved through faith and not out of yourselves it's a gift of God not of works lest any man should boast a lot of churches say yeah we believe that yeah they do they say they do but then they say yeah we believe we're saved by grace but anytime you got a but you got a goat We believe in salvation by grace alone. Here's a, here's a doctrine that many, many do not believe in. The doctrine of eternal security. We believe because the Bible teaches that if you're truly saved and truly born again, you're going to be saved eternally. You're not going to be saved one day and lose it the next. If that's your doctrine, you're not going to make it if you think you're lost all the time. Oh, listen. I'm, I'm so thankful. I can say with Paul, I know in whom I have believed. Amen. And I'm persuaded he's able to keep that, which I've committed unto him. I can't keep it. But hallelujah, this morning, Jesus can. Amen. Eternal security is a, a Baptist doctrine that few really adhere to. And then the priesthood of the believer. I like that doctrine. That tells me I do not have to go to somebody with his little collar turned around in a little booth somewhere and confess my sin to him. I've got a high priest at the right hand of the Father, and the Bible says 24-7, I can approach the throne of grace through my high priest, and I can let my petitions be known that way. There's no preacher, there's no pastor, there's no priest, there's no pope on the face of God's earth that can forgive your sin except the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. These are essential doctrines. And I, as a fundamental Baptist, believe every last one of them. I am what I am, and I ain't going to change. I am what I am. And if any, any church, any denomination, even, even other Baptists, if I know for a fact, they do not believe these cardinal doctrines. I can have no fellowship with them whatsoever. Popeye said, I am what I am. And then he went on to say, I am what I am. And that's all. That I am. I am this morning what I am. I do not make apology for it and I am not ashamed of it. And that's what I am. You see, like Paul, I know in whom I have believed. Do you, do you then know that this morning? Can you? wherever you are right now, can you say that if you were to die today, you'd be with Jesus? Can you say that? Amen. 
Are you positive of that? Do you know that for sure? In this day of change, when, there, when there's so much talk about change and, and changing, I'm telling you, folks, we need to be sure who we am. Amen. You need to be sure who you am. And by the grace of God this morning, as Paul wrote here in Corinthians, I am what I am. And by me, by being able to say that, I know who I am. And I know where I am. And I know one day where I am going to be. <laughs> if you cannot say that this morning, would you bow your head as we close? Just by simple faith, you'd ask Jesus to come into your heart. You receive him by faith and then find a good fundamental Bible believing church or preacher to help you confirm your faith. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, I come to the Lord Jesus Christ as a sinner. I know that I am lost and undone and unclean. And I call upon you, Father, this morning to forgive me of my sin through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And by faith, I accept him as my personal Lord and Savior. I trust his death on the cross as a payment for my sin. I deposit all my sin at the foot of the cross. And I accept Jesus Christ into my heart. Father, this morning I pray. I know this has really not been evangelistic, but Lord, it's, it's time that we know who we are. It's time that we know what we are. And it's time for Baptists to be Baptists. Baptists is not going to save us, but we need to take a stand. And we need to be who we say we am. Thank you for this time. Thank you for those who are listening in. I know not who they are. God, we pray you'll give us wisdom as we resume the services next week. That those who feel comfortable will come and associate themselves in the house of God. We pray for those, Lord, that will, uh, still will be concerned about I'm concerned about it don't don't please don't misunderstand but Lord we believe there comes a time when we must we must get back to assembling ourselves together and we ask you to lead us in that bless brother Jan tonight as he brings the word of God thank you for the message in Sunday school this morning and thank you for this time together and God thank you again that I can say I am what I am and that's what I am in Jesus name amen God bless you thank you for listening this morning